I think people wait to come until after you start, so if we delay the start, it will just delay their arrival. <laughs> that's, that's my theory, and I'm sticking to it. So um, thanks, thanks for coming, those of, those of you who are here, and those of you who are watching on our one of several cameras <laughs> and three microphones. Um, uh, I'm Michael Littman. I'm hosting the Yahoo Rutgers Machine Learning Seminar, and um, I'm very excited today. We have our speaker, uh, Smiranda Murashan. I'm practicing. I, I, I was better in practice. And um, she's coming to us from, from Rutgers, but from the School of Communication and Information, also known as Sky. Uh, she did her PhD in natural language processing at Columbia, and then a postdoc at the University of Maryland before coming to Rutgers. In fact, when she came to Rutgers, Sky wasn't Sky yet. It was Skills, uh, School of Communication, Information, and Library Sciences, but it is Sky now. And um, she's going to be telling us about some of the work that she, uh, she did in her thesis, but also is continuing at Rutgers and she'd uh, be interested in, in having people know about the work and possibly starting collaborations and uh, pursuing joint funding opportunities and sort of whatever seems appropriate. So um, I will just turn it over to her because I think probably none of this was heard because you have the microphone. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Um, so today I'm going to introduce uh, some of the kind of what I can call core research that I'm doing uh, here. It's, uh, at School of Communication and Information, and it derives from my, uh, my thesis at Columbia. Um, so um, just to start with the motivation uh, of this whole research, um, so one of the kind of holy grails of natural language understanding is how can you get from text directly to knowledge. And I'm giving here an example uh, which is more specific and focused, which is um, acquisition of terminological knowledge from directly from text, in this case, definitions. And I'm, uh, here, is, here is an example of definitions in the medical domain where we have the text. And what we want to acquire is this kind of uh, knowledge representation. In this case, it's kind of a graph-based representation where you can see you acquire the hierarchy of information like hepatitis A is a hepatitis, hepatitis B is a hepatitis. But then you can go even more deeper and you get other type of relation. A hepatitis A is caused by a, high, a virus that does not persist in the blood serum. And then a hepatitis B is uh, a virus that um, persists in the blood serum. So um, what we want also to notice here that besides having only concepts in this knowledge, we also have instances on concepts. And in this case, there are two. One, virus 25, for example, an instance. Uh, it's related with hepatitis A, and virus 33, the instance, is related with hepatitis B. So we want to acquire knowledge that capture both um, uh, concepts and instances of concepts. The other side of this, once we acquire this knowledge, we also want to be able to query this knowledge in natural language. So we want to pose questions in natural language and obtain uh, focused answers uh, at the concept level. So these are some examples of questions. So the idea, the technique is to transform these questions in a graph-based meaning representation, and then the question answering basically happens by doing graph matching, where the, uh, for example, what here, what is caused by a virus, it's matched with the concept. So basically what we retrieve, we retrieve the concept and basically this, um, all the concepts related with that. So in order to, to do this, um, basically the goal is to do scalable and deep language understanding. And this was a traditional architecture for language understanding for people who don't uh, work in the area. Basically, what we do have uh, usually is um, a grammar that captures syntax and semantics at the same time. Uh, it's, uh, and then you have a parsing mechanism that takes the text using the grammar, produces a semantic representation, then you have a semantic interpretation that produces the knowledge. So this is kind of the standard uh, pipeline architecture. Uh, the only problem that was uh, when it was this uh, language understanding, it was that most of these grammars were written by hand. So, and then it was applied for very limited domain because it was a, a lot of knowledge, syntax and semantics at the same time. So what we have right now, uh, both in natural language processing, th there is a movement, and then also in uh, artificial intelligence, semantic web, is that we have domain or expert knowledge, or we have semantic models of the domain, model like an ontology. 
So the idea that we want uh, to introduce in this work is to basically to use this uh, knowledge when it exists and to model the semantics of, of, the, of the domain using the ontology. So what we need right now is basically to change in this architecture, we want to, to, use the to change the representation and the grammars. So in order to do that, we will need to change the semantic representation per se, use an ontology-based semantic representation, and at the same time also to have the ontology, uh, which is the semantic model, constrain the grammar. And I'm going to come back to this uh, point later in the talk. So basically now the representation that we are using, it's an ontology-based representation, and uh, we also want to have the ontology to constrain the semantic, uh, uh, semantic parsing as well. And I come back to this later. So besides that, we also want scalability. And in this point, when we want scalability, we want to have a machine learning. Uh, so we want to have a learning model that automatically uh, learn these grammars. So now we have many learning algorithms that exist. And, uh, but then a lot of machine learning algorithms require a lot of training data. And when we think about learning uh, grammars that capture syntax and semantics, you need a lot of semantic, you know, you need to annotate this with a lot of semantic information. Then basically you need, that is time consuming to annotate and it's harder to do. So the requirement for this learning model is to have a small amount of data, but because the representation are complex, you also want relational learning. So the requirements in, uh, in this case will be small amount of data and relational learning. And um, the relational, um, in this talk, I'm going to present briefly um, our learning model, which is relational. And the data that it learns from, uh, I call it learning from representative data. And I'm going to come back to this um, to later. But just to give you an intuition, for example, what is a representative data for a noun phrase can be just an adjective or a noun or the determiner and a noun. And I'm going to come back to this. But learning from uh, this representative data assures uh, learnability guarantees for this uh, learning. So in this talk, I'm going to briefly introduce the grammar formalism so that I can show that capture syntax and semantic and models the ontology, then focus on what relational learning model I'm using, and then uh, uh, show you how this can be used uh, in, um, in language understanding. So starting with the grammar, um, basically the formalism that is used is relies on uh, definite close grammar formalism. And this was an old formalism uh, developed by Pereira and Warren in 1980. And um, these are some characteristics that are useful for, uh, for um, my approach. It's a generic formalism, and it's not tied to any linguistic theory. So you can see it as a computational formalism. You can augment non-terminals, and you're going to see why this is important, because we want to model in these non-terminals uh, the semantic representation, and has constraints. So you can have constraints at the grammar rule uh, level. But the problem with uh, DCG is that they have Turing machine power, and they are undecidable. So you know, if you want to learn them, uh, this uh, is a problem. So for that, um, I introduce a grammar, new grammar formalism. Uh, that I call lexicalized well-founded grammars. And uh, you're going to see where it comes the, the name from. Uh, so basically, the grammars is like in other type of grammars. They have a set of terminal symbols, uh, non-terminal symbols, and the star symbols. But what is represented here in blue is something that I introduce, and this, um, this grammar formalism um, that is specific for these uh, lexicalized well-founded grammars. So besides the non-terminal symbol, we have finite set of elementary semantic molecules. And I'm going to explain shortly what it is, but it's basically the semantic representation attached to the words. Uh, then you have a set of constraint production rules. And I'm going to show you an example of that. And also, we have a partial ordering relation among non-terminals. And I'm going to uh, explain why this is important. So going over the semantic molecules, Basically, in lexicalized well-founded grammar, the lexicon does not consist only on words. It consists of words together with this element semantic representation that uh, they have. So uh, in this case, if we look, for example, for an adjective, you have two, uh, information, two representations. One, which is information for composition, which is a flat feature structure. 
which basically specify the more or less the category that this is an adjective, this is will be used to compose an adjective with a noun or an adjective with an adverb. So kind of how to compose the phrases from words. And then the other part is the, um, the actual semantic representation. This representation is basically a logical form. I call it an ontology-based representation. It's a logical form that is composed of uh, atomic predicates, which of the form concept attribute concept. So let me explain here what, um, so an adjective basically, it's a concept in an ontology. But then the other um, information in the representation that it says, it is a concept in the ontology, but at the same time, it's a value of a property of another concept. So in this case, you're gonna see here, x1, which will be the formal in this case, it's a value of a property, at this point it's uninstantiated because we are a level at the lexicon, uh, of another concept x2. Again, this is a variable not instantiated. But if you look at the ontology, for example, we can imagine that if I were gonna have later the word, the phrase formal proposal, x2 will be instantiated with proposal and then y, the property will be manner. So this is the uh, kind of the idea. At the level of lexicon, we're only gonna have an underspecified representation saying, Adjective is a concept, and then it's a value of a property of another concept. So now the question is how we actually instantiated variables. And this is actually realized through grammar rules. And uh, here how the, the grammar rule looks in lexical, uh, so well-founded grammars. So you're gonna uh, realize here that you can have the context-free backbone, like noun phrase is an adjective followed by a noun. But then what you see, notice is that the, uh, the non-terminals are augmented with the strings. For example, in this case, formal proposal, formal and proposal, and their representation. So you recognize the representation for the adjective. We have a similar representation for the, word, for the noun. And then on the left-hand side, non-terminal, you have the representation for the noun phrase. So uh, how these representation are uh, combined is basically the semantic representation, which is at the bottom, is basically just a concatenation of the so representation of the formal proposal as a phrase. It's a concatenation of the representation of the adjective formal and the noun proposal, uh, together with the variable substitution. Uh, the heads are basically the union and then given by the compositional constraints, which are basically uh, path equation. It's a set of equation. This is very similar with the Peatere formalism in grammars, but um, uh, there are uh, just uh, one level. So it's not, uh, yes? Okay, so I'm not quite getting this yet. How, how should I be able to understand this in detail at this point? Or? Uh, well, I think this, I'm not going to go too much into details, but what happens here is that you're going to see here that uh, you have the representation for the noun proposal and then for the adjective. So the, the semantic representation in, in the noun phrase on the left-hand side non-terminal is just the concatenation of the two. Okay, so but what's why? I see why showing up in a bunch of places, but I don't... Yeah, so why basically is this comes from the representation of the adjective. This will be, in, I will show you when it is gonna be instantiated. Okay. So, so the why will gonna be instantiated through uh, the ontology interpretation. So why, basically what the representation here it says that formal proposal, the representation is there is a concept in the ontology proposal, there is a concept in the ontology formal, and the relationship between these two concepts, it says that proposal, that the, uh, the formal is a value of a property of the word proposal, which is X. So the Y is got instantiated through the ontology interpretation. So this, this, uh, the body of the semantic representation is passed through uh, an ontology interpreter here, and then the Y will gonna be instantiated from the ontology with the slot that is basically the relation between the two concepts, and in this case will be manner. So we have say the word formal proposal, it means that it's a proposal of, with the manner of the proposal it's formal. And then this slot is instantiated depending on the ontology. If in ontology you have another type of value, then this will be the value that you're gonna uh, have instantiated. Yes. Uh, proposal could have a modifier that was merit or type. Exactly. And marriage proposal would instantiate with that part, with a different part property. Exactly. Exactly. So in this case, is basically you do not need to store in the grammar 
this semantic model. And because you take the semantic basically outside of the grammar formalism, it makes it much simpler and you can be able to learn because you lose simpler representation for that. And also what is useful here um, is that the ontology interpretation, because it is a grammar rule level, it also helps in disambiguation. Because for example, if I say I eat par uh, pasta with a fork, with a fork can be associated with I ate, not with pasta. So because I have a, represent a relation between the with a fork, with can be relate only the pasta and the ate, then uh, this actually can disambiguate. Uh, and uh, I'll show, I have an experiment at the end that, uh, that shows this. Um, then um, the third part um, of this grammar is actually the partial ordering among non-terminals. I'm not going to have too much time to talk about that, but when we think about the rules in the grammar, basically the partial ordering means that uh, the, the non-terminals on the left-hand side, this is means an ordered rule, that the left-hand left terminal on the uh, left-hand side is greater than the uh, terminals in the right-hand side, or the um, their associated syntax are, are large, uh, greater. So this property allows parsing termination and decidability of the formalism, allows to define the representative examples and to define the search space as a complete uh, grammar lattice. I'm gonna come back to this complete grammar lattice when we talk about uh, the learning. So uh, the language uh, in lexicalized well-founded grammars is basically all the syntagma that can be derived from the grammar non-terminal. So all these pairs of strings and their semantic representation from any non-terminal. And this would be important. It's not only from the start symbol, it's from all the non-terminal. And this would be important when we do talk about learning. So um, the properties that are useful for learning of this grammar formalism is this partial ordering among non-terminals. Uh, which produces ordered recursive rules, ordered non-recursive rules, or unordered rules. Uh, but the most important piece is that it allows to define us uh, the representative examples and to define the search space as a complete grammar lattice. Uh, it also allows the parsing termination, um, which the empty string cannot be derived in our, in our formalism. And also another requirement is that every uh, non-terminal is a left-hand side in at least one ordered uh, non-recursive rule. And uh, when we talk about the learning algorithm, I'll, I'll point to that. And the third uh, property is actually the category principle. And um, this will help us to define the chains and the predicate invention during the learning. And I'm just gonna give you an example. So what category principle means is that any string in a context have a linguistic category given and known. Especially in linguistic, when we talk about, we know basically that you know, disease is a noun or a skin disease is a noun compound or a severe skin disease is a noun phrase. So in linguistic, you do have the advantage of knowing the categories of all of the you know, words or phrases or sentences. Besides that, lexicalized well-founded grammar also have what is called the unary production rules or the chain. So what you have is here, for example, disease is a noun, but disease can be a noun compound and disease is a noun phrase. And then on the, uh, you see there that the language for the chains, basically the language for the noun is included in the language for the noun compound. So basically the noun compound is more expressive than the noun and the noun phrase is more expressive than the noun compound. And then this will, the chain will come, uh, will be useful uh, during the learning and I'll point to, uh, to that. So, um, this is just a very brief introduction of the grammar formalism. I want to focus now on um, the relational model for learning these grammars. So in order to learn these grammars, basically we need a, a, a learning that basically learn structures. We need to learn structures. We need to able to learn relational representation and to use background knowledge. And uh, we, uh, the, the learning model that I'm using is inductive logic programming, uh, which is a relational uh, machine learning techniques and which was successfully applied to uh, different data mining uh, problems. So for one of you that are not familiar with what inductive logic programming is, basically in inductive logic programming, you are given a correct probability relation, which is a for a first order logic language and you have a background knowledge 
and you have a set of positive and negative examples in the hypothesis language. So the problem is to find the hypothesis such that it, uh, the hypothesis uh, together with uh, the background knowledge explain all the positive example and doesn't explain any of the negative example. And this is this tuple of probability relation, background knowledge, examples, and the hypothesis language is called what is called the inductive logic programming learning problem. But um, now um, this is the mapping from the uh, setup of the inductive logic programming to our uh, learning. The probability relation in our case is given by robust parsing. And uh, I'm going to explain in just in a bit what is that. Uh, then the background knowledge in our case contains the lexicon and the already learned rules. Um, and the positive examples contain these representative examples that, uh, um, that I talked about in the representative sublanguages is used for generalization. And the hypothesis language is a complete grammar lattice. And I'll come back to that. But what is noticed here is that we are able to learn only from positive data. Because this is actually required when you learn language, you do not have instances of negative examples. Uh, and you need to have uh, just positive data. So we um, introduce uh, two or three, poly actually several polynomial algorithms for uh, learning uh, in uh, lexicalized well-founded grammar. One, when it's actually learned from this representative data which are ordered and the other one which is unordered representative examples. And here I'm just going to introduce one, and then uh, later I'm going to discuss um, the trade-off between uh, learning from representative data that are ordered, unordered, or when you actually do not know representative examples. So basically, this algorithm um, assumes that you have these representative examples. You start with one example, you learn a rule, you add it to the set of already learned, and then you continue in iteratively uh, with each example. So just um, so this is uh, the diagram of learning. And I'm going to uh, go more into details uh, over one example. So you start with a uh, current example. Using robust parsing and the background knowledge which contains the lexicon or the ontology, you can generate a more specific rule. Then from this more specific rule, you generalize. You produce a set of candidates rules. Then you, uh, based on a performance criteria using uh, the representative sublanguage for generalization, you choose the one which is the best, and then you add it to the background knowledge and process continues. And I'm going to give an example where it becomes more clear. So basically, the performance criteria in this case is the parsing of the representative uh, the sublanguage. And this is the, um, the basically the parser probability that we talked about before. So let me give you a concrete example. So we start with the background knowledge, and we assume that in the lexicon we have that formal is an adjective, proposal is a noun. And let's assume that we already learned some other rules. We learned for, that an adjectival phrase is an adjective, an or an adjectival phrase is an adverb, uh, followed by an adjectival phrase. This is a recursive rule. We learn also that the noun phrase can be a noun. So this is what we have already in the background knowledge. And now the task is. So now we have the current representative examples, which is the formal proposal. So in this case, when we learn, we have not only the strings, but we also have the, sem the semantic representation. So you have that, uh, the representation that we talked before, formal proposal. You have the category, and then you have the semantic representation. Here it's important um, that the category is given. And the reason why is that when you have this is the example. And in the first step, what you do is you generate the most specific rule. So in, when you generate the most specific rule, you, you have to know what is the left-hand sign on terminal. And, and from the annotation of the representative example, we know that formal proposal is a noun phrase. And in order to generate the, uh, the right-hand side of the rule, you basically use the robust parser that recognizes that formal is, can be either an adjective from the lexicon or an adjectival phrase, because we have the rule that an adjectival phrase can be an adjective, the first one. And can also realize that the proposal it either can be a noun or a noun phrase. So in this particular case, you choose the most specific rule, which is adjective and noun. And you also gener uh, generate the constraints. So this, the constraints are also learned. So this is the most specific rule for this uh, example. Now, 
The second step is to generate a set of candidate grammar rules. And the way to do that is basically using the chains in the grammar or the unary production rules. So the first rule is the non specific rule. The second rule tries to generalize uh, one of the terminals here, adjectives go to adjectival phrase. And then the third rule generalizes adjectival phrase and uh, noun phrase. So these are some examples. And then in order to choose which of these examples are um, the best, you basically try, you're going to parse using each of these individual rules uh, uh, the, the representative sublanguage which is used for generalization. So in the first example, only cover one example from this representative sublanguage formal proposal. The second rule covers two. And the third one, very beautiful painting and formal proposal, and third covers all of the examples in the representative sublanguage. And in this case, basically, you choose the third rule, and this is the best rule. And then you generate, you add it back to the background knowledge and process continue with the next example. So what you can notice here is that we do not generalize more than the examples we have in this representative sublanguage. So if I would say that I'm going to generate this candidate hypothesis in here, but let's assume that I don't have this example, loud, clear noise, the third one. In this case, both the, the second and the third rule will have the same score. And I'm going to choose the most specific one because I don't want to really overgeneralize. So that's why um, it's basically the generalization is constrained by this generalization corpus. So um, the hypothesis search space for, um, for the grammar learning is a lattice where the lattice elements are uh, grammars that preserve the parsing of the representative example. And what it means preserving the parsing of the representative examples is that they can, all the grammars in this lattice can parse the entire set of representative examples. This is very similar idea with inductive logic programming where it, what is called inductive logic programming consistency, where all the hypotheses that you generate need to validate still the positive examples. You cannot generate hypotheses that are not uh, able to uh, to uh, entail the, the examples. So just to give you an idea of what this lattice looks like, uh, the bottom element basically you can see as a, uh, the most specific grammar. Uh, and in our case, let's assume that we have the representative example noise, uh, loud noise and the noise, and the representative sublanguage, uh, the one that we have clear loud noise and the, the loud noise. The bottom grammar is basically the grammar that has in the right hand side only part of speech. So it's the really the most specific one. The top grammar is the most general one. And in between are grammars that are, in this case, they only have one rule going from the bottom up grammar. It's the one, the rule R2 is generalized. So basically in this case, we have adjective and noun phrase. The other one is, um, so basically the, the bottom grammar can be obtained from the robust parsing just using the lexicon. And in this case, the right-hand side not, uh, are just part of speech. Uh, the top uh, grammar in the lattice derives all the representative sublanguage, all this generalization corpus, so it's the most um, uh, general. Uh, the specialization step preserves the parsing of the representative examples of going from the top grammar to G1 or going from the top grammar to G2. We still generate grammars that parse all of the representative. Uh, examples and the specialization step also decreases the, the semantic metric, which basically means that G1 and G2 are more specific than the top uh, grammar. So these, um, these properties of parsing of representative examples assures that we can learn only from positive examples and we don't need uh, uh, negative examples. I'm not going to enter too much into details, but we did prove a learnability theory. Um, that states that um, if we have the representative example set uh, associated with the grammar and a representative sublanguage that is conformal, then we can always learn this uh, grammar from, um, from uh, the representative examples and the representative sublanguage as the grammar lattice top element. So uh, based on this um, theorem of learnability, um, I, was, um, I was working to actually develop now practical algorithm. And uh, the one that I presented was learning from ordered representative examples. 
And for that case, this, uh, actually the hypothesis space is a Boolean algebra is not, uh, it's actually even more powerful, but, uh, so the advantage is that you only need a small set of annotation because the representative example is a small set. But the problem is in language is that you do not know the order. So how do I know that I need first to learn an adjective or phrase, then a noun phrase, and if you go more and more complex, you don't know, I mean, asking the user to just give you the order where the, the learner has to do is actually really, uh, it's more um, uh, troublesome. Uh, then for, for this reason, uh, developing a learning that is unordered, so even uh, if you don't have the exact order, then you can um, uh, do a learning algorithm that basically proves that converges to the same uh, grammar like the, the one from the order example. It's an iterative algorithm, uh, and in this case, the hypothesis space is a complete grammar lattice. But now the other question that came is that, well, it's good that you have the representative examples, nice properties, everything, but then how do you know, how can you actually specify which are the representative example for a learning problem? And uh, in this case, uh, you can develop an algorithm that does not know that. Uh, you can get to the entire representative sublanguage, but the problem with that is that you have to annotate this larger set that used for generalization, you have to annotate with the, the entire representation. So there is a trade-off between being a small set where you annotate and you know the properties or being annotating larger set and then developing that. But all these algorithms basically converge to the same grammar, but uh, one are more efficient than others. And also the trade-off between um, uh, the annotation that is required. So, um, I want to go now on some, how can we uh, use this uh, in um, this grammar that uh, once we learn it. And to do, um, to talk about that, I want to talk about an idea of how can we think about meaning uh, in, in language. And uh, this is an idea that um, I was actually playing with, defining the meaning as the text together with the question and answer that you can actually get related with that text. So let's assume that we have this example, we're persuading the doctor to examine us, then what is the meaning of this, of this text? So if you associate the text with all the questions that you can ask and all the answers that you get, who persuaded the doctor? We, whom did we persuade the doctor? What did we persuade the doctor to examine? And, and so on and so forth, basically defining that. Um, so we have questions which are complex human-like questions and the answer are precise at the concept level. And another thing that is important here uh, when we think about this um, is to see the natural language as a problem formulation rather than problem solving. Because if you start doing a lot of inferences and then go, for example, in the ontology, then you might end up in uh, having a lot of reasoning and then it might not be uh, efficient. So in order to go from text to the knowledge, we need to have several levels of representations that are usually used in, um, in natural language processing. So in my case, um, we have the representation that is associated with the, at the grammar rule, at the utterance level. So if we have, for example, you persuaded the doctor to examine us, the first uh, representation, which I call ontology semantic representation minus, and this minus comes before applying the ontology interpretation. So before even look, going to the, the ontology interpretation that is a, at the grammar rule level that I mentioned before. At this point, you see the one, I'm not sure if it's, uh, you can see it, uh, this, um, the variables P1, P2, P3, and so on and so forth, there are still variables that are not instantiated because you do not have instantiation from the ontology at this point. Now you do have the second level, still at the utterance level, you have after you apply this ontology constraints. So in this case, you instantiate, for example, persuaded um, that you have the argument, theme, and property, or experience in the perceiver. So basically, you instantiate the thematic roles of the verbs after you have the, the ontology constraints. The grammar is reversible. So at this point, you basically have the reversibility. The second, uh, the other type of representation is the text knowledge representation. So basically once you do and you parse it through the grammars, you basically constate, you can think about this as a discourse level representation when you put all of your um, uh, representations together. At this point, you basically, all of the concepts, all of the uh, variables uh, are, uh, become constant and they can be uh, you know, concepts in the ontology. 
And then the, third, the, the last one is basically the knowledge representation or ontology level representation that can be task specific. And here we have concept identity, which basically is a bijection between a graph vertex and the referent. So um, in this case, what it means, task specific interpretation. So for example, in terminological knowledge, we can ignore determiners or we can have an aphora resolution. If I say John, and then I mention next in the discourse he, then I'm doing an aphora resolution ma matching he and John, and then basically they will be represented in the same uh, vertex in the graph. So doing this kind of an aphora resolution and discourse processing, it happens in this task specific interpretation. Um, this, uh, once we work with this graph representation, we can see the logical equivalence as a concept identity, and this is because we can have this task-specific uh, uh, interpretation. So if, for example, if I have the, the sentence, the book has not been given, been read, uh, being, being read by Kim, uh, here um, the representation you can have read Kim and the book, which is, uh, you know, you basically have the agent, the, the, uh, the event, and uh, the team book. But you can also represent all everything that is related with the verb. You can represent the tense, which is present, the progressive aspect, perfect aspects, and so on, and the voice, which is voice passive. So you basically can represent all the. Then you can ask who has not been um, reading the book. So in this case, if I ask this question, if I represent the voice as a passive, then this I cannot answer directly because I represent the voice as a passive. But then if I tend to ignore that, then we can actually get an answer. So you basically, for example, especially for terminological knowledge that I work with, even if this is represented, I ignore all the tense and aspects because it's much less likely to be important and I only keep the event, the agent, and the team. So uh, you can do, um, uh, you can decide what you want to ignore in your, uh, in your application from the representation. So, um, from the uh, um, experiments, um, we work with some uh, annotated example in uh, 151 in this case, or like around four, uh, 500 uh, representative sublanguage, which was weekly annotated. And we also need to give the lexical category, which basically means part of speech, uh, elementary semantic molecule types, the non-terminals that was used, and basically we end up learning uh, 100, around 150 uh, rules. Uh, and uh, we did a qualitative evaluation, which I want to uh, first look at some complex linguistic phenomena that some of the handwritten rules, uh, the grammars, uh, are able to capture, and then an experiment on terminological knowledge acquisition. So the type of phenomena I was interested in was derived from the terminological knowledge acquisition, where we have the definitions that we need to, um, to be able to cover, but also some of the uh, phenomena that are harder to model, uh, for example, like rising and control constructions that are usually given an example in this uh, deep uh, uh, grammar formalism, long distance dependency, like relative closing and WH question. And um, we did uh, around 100 complex utterances and uh, linguistic phenomena were covered, but we also encountered a lot of ambiguity. Uh, as you can see in this example, which is more complex, Monsanto president who seems to try to get royalties from the farmers, who grew genetically modified soil illegally, will be giving a briefing for the Brazilian media tomorrow at noon. So here you have the illegally can be either associated with grew or with get. So you basically going to have still going to have ambiguities. Um, and here is basically the kind of representation that you get. I'm oh, sorry that you get from uh, using these kind of complex sentences. So uh, in the terminological knowledge acquisition, what we did is um, first we extract definitions not only from dictionaries, but basically we extract uh, definitions directly from uh, online text, from consumer-oriented medical text using uh, a rule-based system called Definder. And um, so we use those as an input for our um, uh, parser. So we did uh, this definition we're automatically extracting. As a lexicon, because we work on the medical domain, we need to uh, use a medical uh, lexicon, uh, which is called Unified Medical Language System. And what we use in this case was only a weak ontological model. And actually, this is very important, because for some 
of the cases. For some of the domains, you don't have ontology. If you want, I'm going to mention briefly in my future work, I want to uh, work on machine translation and other languages, which doesn't have a lot of resources. So when you don't have an ontology, what happens then? So in this case, we use a weak ontological model where we only use thematic roles of verbs and prepositions uh, and attributes and adjectives from WordNet. So these are the, the resources that we use. So for the acquisition, we basically what we, um, we learned was that if you don't use the ontology, you, you end up having 2.3 average parses per definition. If you use the ontology, it removes some of the ambiguity, but not all. We still uh, end up having some ambiguity because of this uh, weak semantic model. But what we did is actually we had uh, the user select uh, which one uh, is correct and then add it to a uh, knowledge. And w when we presented it, we actually presented the graph-based representation, which was easier for the user to actually see. And then we also did a query experiment when we asked precise and vague question. I come back to this, what it means. So basically, we only focus on who did what to whom kind of questions. And uh, here also the ambiguity is reduced. So this is the, the example I give at the beginning. Uh, where this is type of representation that we obtain. And here is the type of um, the question. So basically, this querying is a dog matching problem where the WH word will match concepts in the knowledge base. So in this case, what will match hepatitis B in the first example. You can also have this type of questions, um, what is caused by something that does not persist in the blood serum. So in this case, I call it vague or underrepresented, where something will match with, uh, for example, in this case, virus and then uh, what will match with hepatitis. So basically, we're going to have an under-specified uh, um, uh, representation. So the advantages for um, it is you can actually have questions relevant to particular instances of concepts. And this is obtained through a dog matching problem. And you can also have semantic equivalence uh, given different syntactic forms. So active, passive, or you can have reduced relative clauses, active, passive, construction involving rising verbs. So you basically ob obtain a semantic uh, a representation that is uh, uh, for different syntactic, uh, uh, syntactic forms. So um, this is, um, I introduced like, this lexical is well-founded grammar which are able to capture syntax and semantics. And through this ontology constraints, provide access to meaning during the parsing. And it helps in this ambiguation. Uh, the semantic representation is an ontology query language, and they are learnable. And the, semantic, the learning model is a relational learning algorithm, which is uh, in, right now it's only like logic based. The search space is a grammar lattice, and we provide the learnability theory. This is the theoretical conclusion. If natural language can be covered by these grammars, natural language can be learned. But now the problem, the thing is that how can you prove that? And you know, you need to find out like how can you actually prove this? This is um, something that you still uh, need, and some people can come up with counterexamples. But definitely, this formalism is more powerful than context-free grammars, and probably it's, it's in uh, the mild context-sensitive grammars, like other, like uh, three-adjoining grammar, for example. And we also introduce a framework for induction and uh, direct text to knowledge acquisition and introduce several algorithms for that. Now I want to talk just at the end about some of my current and future work. And the one that I'm mostly focusing right now is to use the probabilistic, to introduce a probabilistic notion of these grammars, and especially probabilistic ontology. Because right now the ontology is that is this existing or is not existing in ontology. There is a relation between two concepts or is not. So it's just like true or false. But then in the language, you can have accessibility relations between concepts more or less. I mean, depending on the context, you can say something. Um, so modeling ontology with probabilities, this will be uh, kind of the, the focus. And then the questions is, if once you have this probabilistic ontology, do you need to have probability at the rule level as well? So how, where you add probability? Are you adding the probability in the ontology or the rules or both? So that's um, kind of things I'm working on. Once you do that, then you need to do the learning and parsing with both hard and soft constraints, because right now the probability being a constraint in the grammar and having weights, then you need to, uh, to, to change the parsing uh, algorithm as well. 
Uh, another design of work that uh, I started actually working on was in machine translation. I did my, when I did my postdoc at the University of Maryland, I worked on statistical machine translation. And one line of work that uh, we are actually using right now is to use these lexicalized, well-founded grammars to generate paraphrases, because this is reversible grammars, and then encode the paraphrasing in a lattice and then use that in machine translation. So this, um, but then my focus right now is to focus on low density languages and basically learn grammars that will be uh, useful for other languages which doesn't have a lot of resources because in statistical machine translation you need to rely on large of parallel data or you need to learn on bilix, bi, uh, bilingual dictionaries and so on and you don't have it so uh, using this. And this is a proposal that we wrote uh, recently with uh, Maryland, Columbia and MIT to kind of uh, using these um, grammars and methods. Hmm? Yeah. It's not NSF, it's a MURI proposal. Yeah, it's a DARP. Um, and uh, the third line related with this work is bootstrapping the grammar and the ontology. And uh, basically this relates with learning ontologies from text and learning grammar for sublanguages. So basically the idea is that you may, may start with no ontology whatsoever or very weak ontology. You parse some definition like sentences, then you update the ontology and then you use and learn more. So kind of bootstrapping this approach will be uh, interesting or merging ontologies uh, through text using this kind of technique. So if people are interested in working on these aspects, I'm looking for collaborations, especially like the ones like probabilistic ontologies that I know close to almost nothing about, but <laughs> I'm, I'm interested in uh, how to use those uh, uh, in, my fr in my framework. Um, I, yes, but basically what I use, right, yeah, so I think you can do, what I did use, it was just more or less like WordNet or Unified Medical Language System. Like but psych, I haven't used that, no. But what I need more in an ontology is this kind of a graph based when you do have the concepts and the relation between the concepts, kind of a frame-based model of an ontology. This is kind of what's more important for You might have answered these on the conclusion slide, but I wasn't sure if I was connecting them mm -hmm. up right. It seemed like the, the learning algorithm that you're using would be very badly thrown off if there was little bits of error. Yes, it. yes. Uh, yes. And it is, is the idea that, sorry, in, the, in the data, is, is the probabilistic LWFT a way of trying to... I'm trying to, uh, yeah, I'm trying to look into that and especially looking at some of the, like, uh, there is uh, some recent work on using noise in these stochastic inductive logic programming frameworks, and I'm trying to see if some work of that can be actually used in here and how to can be not so painfully punished by the noise, yeah. What's a probabilistic ontology? So in my thing is that you can actually have, uh, the way I'm seeing right now is to use um, weights uh, related with association between concepts. So for example, if I say, in my right now is I have like flying pig, Right, so this can be a very weak weight. It might be because in a, using in a metaphorical sense, you might have it and it might be acceptable, but you have a very, very well, like low weight assigning to that. So that's my, but then how to model it, how to assign these weights, how to infer it, probably using Markov logic will be like a way to do that, but I'm, yeah, I'm still, that's my. Yes. So you showed how the ontological constraints can help resolve ambiguity. Have you looked at how they can help no, I literally avoid working with quantification. Uh, I am, it's really a hard problem. And um, right now what I'm, what I'm doing is actually I'm ignoring the terminals. And it's like, yeah, uh, it would be very interesting to, like, to see how that will work in my, my system, but I, it's, it's a hard problem and it's, right now I didn't. Yeah, bootstrap usually is very only local, very local. Uh, right, so right now what I'm thinking here, it was just, um, right now, for example, ontology 
it's not even used at all during the learning piece because we already have everything annotated there and it's not, you don't have the ontology. So this is the idea of like maybe, it's much, much more, it's not, I probably am not gonna even see bootstrapping, but um, the idea is that you can start with a zero ontology and then you learn grammar rules and then you populate this ontology and then this ontology will be then used more in the learning parsing and then kind of this much more this vision of bootstrapping rather than literally Another question. So, do, do you have a sense, this, since the grammar formalism is, is new, mm -hmm. or, yeah, relatively new, do you have a sense of what kinds of languages it's really good for? Uh, not, uh, maybe language is probably the wrong word, I probably don't know the right word, but languages use, English even, is used mm -hmm. for many different kinds of things. So one is, you know, blog, and another one is for, right. you know, formal medical text, another mm -hmm. one is for mm -hmm. dialogue between people, and another one might be for give, uh, issuing commands of various sorts. Right, right. Um, do you have a sense of, is it tailored for any one of those? Do you think it's better I'd for some than others? Um, Right now, I mean, the, the, that's why I did the qualitative study kind of to try to model what people say it's actually harder for, let's say, context free grammars or other type of formalism to actually capture. And then I did rising and control long distance dependency, which are much more. Um, the answer to your question is that because the parser, it's robust. It basically, if it doesn't know how to parse, if I, for example, if I go to noisy text, like blog or tweets, I mean, I think no parser right now works on tweets, I mean, even if they do statistical train on Wall Street Journal, they are not gonna work on Twitter or other type of data. But what is advantages here is that you can actually have the parser which is robust in the sense of like, if I don't know how to parse the entire thing, I give you the chunks I know. And because I have this semantic representation, I still give you a richer representation than just, just a maybe syntactic tree or something like that. But to answer what type of phenomena and then all of this, I don't prob probably dialogue, I would say not so much, much more on the type of text, but questions, for example, can answer, like, the models very well, so. But then that's actually, a pro I mean, we actually have a project right now that I didn't mention here, and it's a, with my colleagues in Nina Wackholder and Mark Akos in communication. We are looking and finding language of oppositions in blocks, so how people can oppose each other. Are they making an argument versus having an argument? Like, you know, do, having a reason or just saying you're stupid or dismissive? And then looking at uh, how much, um, because a lot of this uh, opposition disagreement, were, uh, when it was used, it was using just lexical features and very shallow phrase level features. And we want to see if using much more semantics or discourse even will actually help in finding this type of more ad deeper on uh, opposition levels. So then we're gonna look on the blogs and stuff, so we'll see there how this will actually get <laughs> used. I think, I think the answer to your question is languages for which you have ontologies. Right, I mean, here it's, the, yeah, so I think one thing that we are actually looking at this language, um, low density languages, like in my experiment, I use this very weak ontology where you do have the thematic roles and so on. If you have ro uh, richer ones, for example, when you have uh, synonymy, where you have hierarchy of concepts, hierarchy of roles, then your model becomes much stronger. If you don't have it at all, this is an optional constraint in the grammar, you can ignore it, but then how it behaves and how it constrains the disambiguation problem, then you might need a lot of probabilities probably, even in the rule levels for that, so. The, the, the labels, the, the learning algorithm runs off of label data, and here the label mm -hmm. data means you have text, you have a parse of the text, and you have all the links into all of the ontologies for all the elements of the text. Yeah, so basically what you do have, no, you don't have the, the ontology, because in this learning you don't uh, have that. You, yeah, you basically have unlabeled dependency. Uh, So this is type of annotation you have. <coughs> so you do have the text. You need to specify this, the category, and like, for example, the some attributes related. It's, for example, if you want to model agreement, if this singular or plural, or kind of in order to model that. And you do have the semantic um, representation here. But what I did is actually, I don't have here a screenshot, but wh what we are doing, uh, actually I'm working with um, a student in CS, in master student, to develop an annotation tool. Uh, and the annotation tool, basically what it gives, it, um, 
it will gonna have the text, but it uses the robust parser because you already, the lexicon is not learned. You do have that given. So if you have the robust parser, it will give you the semantic representation of each of the words. So the user will not need to type those representations because then the, the representation of the entire phrase is just composed based on the concatenation of those. So what the user will need to do is kind of semantic dependency relations between those and to introduce the head. So we are working on this kind of not having the user type by hand uh, this logical form. Okay, well, so I think that we should probably uh, have a lunch available at this point. Um, so why don't we start the formal discussion as we go, but thank you very much. Mm -hmm. for